if we have that clip um, about the the nationalizing the oil industry, yeah, I have it ready right here. This is a perfect example. Like we could nationalize this stuff and pay for this stuff for families, right? And it's and I, I love first the meta comment is I love how eager Charlie was for agreement on things here. Like mm -hmm. like I don't I'm not I'm not defending the farm industry and all that stuff, right? Like he he likes to put his I, I, endlessly fascinated by that. Uh, sort of emerging dynamic, but let's play this uh, clip about nationalizing oil. Yeah, so we have this clip about, and I just wanted to note before that, because um, we can't play every clip in here, but Ben does a really great job uh, before this clip where Charlie sort of has a cherry picked uh, quote is from the, the Danish as the president or prime minister, um, you know, basically saying that we're not, we're not a socialist country, uh, which Ben was prepared to, you know, to answer. And I think he answered it very well by basically saying, um, and tell me if I'm uh, misrepresenting your argument, like, you know, asking the guy, the, the leader of like the center right party in Denmark about, you know, if the country is socialist would be like asking me um, or like other ra radical communists in the United States about, you know, how communists or what the what the <laughs> political situation in America is like, you know, it's sort of like an absurd. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 like the idea. Yeah, Lars Rasmussen, I think is his name, who is the uh, uh, Danish prime minister um, who, yeah, represents center right party. Uh, then, and he has this quote, oh, there's nothing socialist about all these social programs. It's like, I don't know, maybe the socialist governments who actually implemented those programs would disagree. But also, I mean, is 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 Lars Rasmussen, is, is he like the spokesman for the Danish hive mind, you know, like that, <laughs> uh, that everybody in Denmark, you know, agrees with this? No, I, I thought that was great. But so here's, but here's uh, on Norway and oil and nationalization. And I think this is a really interesting exchange here. You know, if you look at how long socialist parties were in power in Denmark and how many of those programs came about under them, I would not say that these are societies that have achieved socialism. We can certainly talk about what, I, what that would mean to me. But I would say that these are societies where socialist parties allied with strong unions have brought about really beneficial social reforms as an effort to move farther in that direction. So let's talk about Norway, a sure, country that yeah. I'm familiar with, you're familiar with um very wealthy country yeah why uh because uh you know i think the biggest i think the biggest reason is that they have done something that i'm sure that you wouldn't support which is nationalize their oil you industry. mean use fossil fuels not keep it in the ground like bernie sanders would be bernie sanders has tweeted we need to keep all fossil fuels in the ground but norway's built a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund now that's okay so uh so so would you support that nationalization no but it's better than keeping it in the ground okay sure. i mean look i think ultimately we probably are better off you know transitioning to other energy sources but uh but if we're going to use oil i would much rather that that oil be in the hands of the people that it fund generous social programs like in norway and i often do kind of get a sense when conservatives say this it's like oh well there's really nothing socialist about it. They've just nationalized the oil industry and used the proceeds to fund all of these social programs. Well, I mean, if that's not socialist, can we at least have that not socialist let, thing? That sounds nice to me. Let me clarify is that if there is wealth to be redistributed, there must be wealth to be redistributed. Sure. And yeah. Norway has the advantage of having some of the most strategic oil reserves in the country. And I just pinpoint it in particular yeah. because there tends to be this anti-fossil fuel development I mean, movement. It's, it's something Norway and, us, and the United States have in common is that we have a lot of oil. Now, if you want to, again, I know you've said you don't, don't want to do this. No, of course, if, I think the private ownership of minerals is a strategic advantage for the United States. But let me ask you about what I sure. think is one of the reasons why I think the Scandinavian country's pursuit of egalitarianism. Yeah, you're, you're muted, David. David. So I, I actually have that uh, clip for later because the immigration argument is not new. But that was a yeah. I, I, <laughs> I mean, uh, Ben, yeah. Should we be nationalizing oil? Yeah, I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, the second he he said like Norway wealth, I knew it was going to be, you know, that like some kind of gotcha about oil, and it's like. I, again, I mean, it just seems like such a simple point. It's like, okay, yeah. so so we're in agreement. We should nationalize the American oil industry and use it to fund a generous welfare state. That sounds good. It's, I mean, frankly, like you see why this group like specializes in making like videos that are one way, right? Because they, they sort of think that the left is like this kind of tender group where like, you know, if you say like, you know, because we believe in climate change, and we want to reduce our like oil consumption, that if you note that 
some countries have used nationalization of like natural resources for the betterment of their society, a principle that we do also that we agree with that we're just going to like explode in front of them and, you know, fall apart. Oh my God, it was oil, right? Which is like, whatever. Could yeah. you imagine how much better American society would be if instead of all of the rich oil wealth that we have in this country, <laughs> instead of it just gliding the pockets of a few billionaires, um, ended up going to benefiting American working people? I mean, they would never do that. In, yeah. You know, I mean, it would We'd be transitioned off it by now. We would be. Yeah, that's <laughs> for sure. yeah, yeah. I mean, we would be living in, in, in a, frankly, probably something close to utopia or, or socialism in that kind of system. I mean, if no, you exactly. were using I mean, oil well. There'll be such benefit. a huge redistribution of wealth to, to have that happen. And again, I mean, whatever the energy resource is, like the point of principle is I want that to be uh, to be publicly owned, you know, and which uh, none of those guys like it, whether it's, you know, like whether it's oil, uh, which you know, Norway got away with. But I mean, that was what led to the coup in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, lithium, uh, you know, it, uh, being, you know, being nationalized. Um, you know, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the point is here's this huge, incredibly profitable industry. Who do we think should control it? Who do we think should have the money? And at the end, he just kind of asserts and that, yeah, I think he's about to change the subject to immigration, but he just kind of asserts with no explanation that it's a strategic advantage, uh, to have like individual rich people own the nation's oil resources. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and that's and, and you see what happens in the state of Texas uh, when you have all of these private corporations controlling our oil is mass uh, pollution, a uh, destruction of farmland, um, not to mention the fact that these guys get together and they start making demands against the government. Um, it's just, uh, it, you know, it's it's yeah. it's a weird argument. And again, like nationalization is, is a good thing just for people who might be stumbling on it's like, you know, the argument even for nationalization um from like a eco socials perspective is that that also mm -hmm. gives us the ability to democratically decide how much we're producing and what we're producing yeah. for versus just leaving it to an anarchic anarchic system uh, like we, we currently have, which just means that, um, you know, shell oil is, uh, you know, continuing to ravage the earth while producing podcasts saying that like they understand all the problems, you know, just like fainting and acting like they understand all the problems um, and that they're really finally listening to activists and, and the public. I don't know. I'd much rather have a situation where the government could just, you know, pull the cord if we needed to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the government is controlling the oil industry, then we can make collective democratic decisions about all of those all of those things. Now, that said, I do want to give credit where credit's due here. Uh, it is undeniably true that in order for there to be wealth to be redistributed, there has to be wealth to be redistributed. That's and true. Also, well, that Norway has some of the largest... Uh, reserves of oil in the country of Norway, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, unlike the United States, um, a very oil poor country. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, like we definitely couldn't afford to use the same. Mechanism. I don't know. Yeah, it's just like there, <laughs> maybe if we were in in France or something, I could get that. But I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious, unless you had something, Matt, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of talk about the international stuff. But yeah, well, I just wanted to note uh, one thing, a couple of things, which is like one, he peddled. Uh, in addition to peddling to the family an awful lot, he also said that won't work because of immigrants quite an awful lot. Yeah. That seems to be mm -hmm. a recurrent theme, but also just generally missing the, like the principle, just like in that clip. And we don't have this clip, but there's another section where he's like, what if you could give workers a tax cut and it wouldn't affect the budget at all, actually. And he was surprised you would take that. Like as if you just want to tax workers because you like the government to have money. As this, you know, like not yeah. really, really understanding the principle of where like somebody from the genuine left would care about like wh which dollars go where. No, exactly. Like I, I don't uh I mean taxes, I mean tax taxes on billionaires might actually serve an independent function because right. you know that reduces their political power and all that stuff but like taxes on workers are not an end in themselves i, I don't want to actually eliminate the fica tax like we say because i know that the effect of that you know i know where the money would be taken out on the other end right let's put it that way yeah. which is but, social yeah. security and medicare yeah exactly but like once I kind of said that, he was like, okay, but hypothetically, let's say that absolutely nothing was going to be cut. I was like, well, okay, and that hypothetical, <laughs> sure, you know, like, I, you know, but it's like, I don't know what that's supposed to prove, you know, like, that, that's a little bit like saying, like, if, if you, you know, hey, if, if you could get a lifetime supply of your favorite whiskey and you're never going to be charged with it and nothing bad was going to happen to you as a result, do you want it? It's like, sure, 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's money in workers' pockets. That that frankly, like, I mean, per, per, like you said, like I'd rather it co- that money comes from the capitalists than any sort of government. Right, right, and exactly. if you say like like there's some sort of weird thing where it can't be used for any new f- programs if you do have that tax, but like yeah, get all. I would have the very opposite of what Charlie wants, which is a flat tax, which is like the backwards L tax, where you start right, right, at the right. highest rate, just have it, just take all that money, all that money until everyone is nice and even. Uh, no, uh, no, no, exactly. I mean, like you, you, if you can fund all the, all of the, uh, you know, the social services that are actually, you know, going to benefit. I mean, really, actually, we could talk about how Social Security and Medicare are funded, and, and I agree, there are much better ways to do it. Uh, yeah. That you know, that would be, um, that would be more progressive, you know. But like, to the extent that you can tax workers, it's only because that stuff that's going to lead to services the loss of which would hurt them more than the tax does. Well, I mean, it's a similar thing when we were sort of arguing against Andrew Yang's UBI, right? It's like, I'm very happy for people to be getting extra money. Sure. Um, you know, but right. if, if it, that is also being, you know, used to sort of argue for more cuts uh, to our already meager social safety net, uh, absolutely not. I wanted to sort of, maybe this is, this is just maybe something mm-hmm. of, of interest to me because I've been reading a lot of uh, Leo Panish again and sort of getting into like thinking about socialist transformation, um, talking about these Scandinavian countries, because I would like to hear what both of y'all think mm-hmm. about um, this, because Ben, I think you do a, a really great job in this debate. And it's almost always how these debates go is they want to find the country that we think is the good socialist country. And then they want to find a problem in it and sort of or, or, or something that contradicts the statement that we have. And it's it's and I, actually maybe before we get into the point that I want to make, um, I'm curious about how you feel about this as somebody, you know, who's studies logic and, and, and thinks about debate. Um, you know, and I, I think you show in that that debate a, uh, um, a great way of doing it, but I'm just curious how you go into those conversations because there's a part of me that always just wants to be like, oh, whenever they start talking about Norway or, or Denmark or something like that, said like, yeah, I mean, I like things like, you know, healthcare and all this kind of stuff, but by no means is this like the end goal social society mm-hmm. and I don't want to get pigeonholed. But I think you did a good job at sort of finding a way to, to balance saying, hey, these things, some of these things work, but also you're not going to make me own all of, you know, Norwegian society. I don't know. How do you think about like dealing with somebody using an example that you might not want to be using and trying to find a way to flip that on them? Yeah. I mean, I think actually when he started asking me about which countries I'd I'd point to, which is what happened just before that, you know, he Mm -hmm. was like, oh, what are countries and, you know, in the world, you know, you'd you'd point to that embody, you know, what you, uh, you know, what like, or I don't know, our socialist, I think is how he put it. But like that, that was the, that was the idea. And, and, and so, you know, it says, well, look, there are no countries in the world where I've got everything mm-hmm. that I want, right. You know, but, uh, but uh, the, you know, the Nordics, you know, have implemented a lot of short-term reforms that I do want. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but I did front load before I think we even threw back to him, look, these are complicated societies. Right wing parties sometimes win elections, and they, mm-hmm. they they do things that I don't like. Uh, the, the the point is not that everything that exists in any Nordic country is good, and you know, and everything that does you know you know like is bad. The point is the reason to talk about the Nordics is that these are thriving economies, which shows that you don't. It's not going to lead to like economic catastrophe to mm-hmm. do this program. Uh, where a lot of the things that we want have been successfully beta tested, you know, they, they you know, a lot of these sort of expansive social democratic uh, policies that take certain parts of the economy outside of the market uh, and and uh, and provide for certain human needs that certainly aren't provided for in the United States. But actually, I thought in some ways that the funniest thing about that is that in the very beginning of the debate, like in the opening statement, mm-hmm. I said. We could talk about what I would consider, you know, to, you know, my idea of utopia and contrast to yours, but be, but, you know, we could do that later if you want, but let's talk about the baby steps in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And then like when he was queuing me up for the Norway thing, so he could do all of his gotchas about, you know, about, you know, things in Norway that I would like, or that he didn't think I'd like, uh, you know, I, I said, we saw in that clip, look, these are clearly not fully socialist societies. That's not the reason that I'm bringing them up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then later on, you know, I, I think it might have been in the second half. He said, "Well, I feel like you're cloaking your radicalism by by talking about, you know, basically these incredibly popular policies like minimum wage and healthcare." I was like, 
I am. I mean, it kind of seems like I'm, I'm I'm the one who keeps bringing it up that I actually do have more radical long-term goals than just being like Norway. Mm-hmm. No, I think exactly. And like, I don't know. It's just like, I mean, we've done this debate on this show. We played a debate between like, Yarn Brook and, and Leo Panich on like socialism, right? And there's just kind of fixation like, well, this is a socialist policy and this is not a socialist policy, right? Which is, I just think is something that like, well, we have to go out and like fight people on their own terms and in terms that they understand and not make things seem so complicated that we're avoiding uh, questions. We also need to be careful, I, I think, not to fall into the trap of thinking that like certain policies are are, are necessarily social. Like, like, let me give you an example of this because this is something that I thought um, was an interesting point. I can't remember if it was in regards to Norway or Finland or I can't remember what exactly a Nordic country is talking about. But he was talking about, um, I, I believe it was Norway, it doesn't have a minimum wage. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of like that's like, you know, such a bad thing. But people need to remember that, like, in we advocate for a minimum wage in the United States because class power is so uh, lopsided against working people that we actually have to set just like a minimally allowed legal standard for what you can pay a worker. Right. It's not something like you don't need a minimum wage in a situation where you're able to sort of break. Of uh, the power of capital, and certainly, if you were living in a social society where you've completely broken the right. power of capital, you wouldn't need one at all, right? Um, but a minimum wage is like something that, if you're looking at the board, if you're looking at class power in society, and saying, okay, we might not be able to get all the things that we want, but hey, we could prevent them from paying people, you know, starvation wages. You put that in place, right? And in the United States, again, we're advocating for an increase in the minimum wage because we are in that kind of weakened position. But it's not that necessarily, like in and of itself. Like the minimum wage is like the the true heart beating heart of socialism. It's yeah. a legal power that we can find, you know, I don't know, to sort of like cement some some victories for ourselves to make mm -hmm. sure that things can't be pulled back. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just like these are like some of the bigger things that I'm thinking that like we need to start being prepared to wrestle with when we're engaging with the public and when we're engaging with right wingers, be prepared to like push back against their nonsense, but also not making the mistake ourselves that when Kirk says, for example, a country doesn't have the minimum wage, we're like, oh, no, you know, that means that it's like a bad country, right? It, it actually yeah. means that things are, are stronger there um, for working people than they are in the United States. Yeah, which, which, yeah, this actually did come up uh, in the debate that uh, that he, he said, uh, well, you know, you know, Ned Denmark doesn't have a minimum wage you know Denmark, surely yeah. this is the first time i've ever heard that right uh you know like that's that's not a point right wingers love to to bring mm -hmm. up and it's like yeah but you have to say the other half that it's not that it's not that they don't have a minimum wage so uh the market you know it's just like whatever you know whatever the market can bear you know like whatever you know like individual workers are desperate enough to work for is what you can pay them it's that they have incredibly strong labor unions that negotiate agreements for entire sectors of the economy and that you know the wage floor is enforced that way